if you've been to one of these events before, thank you very much for returning. And if, you, if it's your first time, then welcome. Um, this is actually our fifth round table. Uh, about five minutes before the meeting, we were literally counting it as, uh, you know, trying to work out how many we had had. Um, but yeah, really excited to be on our fifth one now. Um, so yeah, thank you for joining. Um, if we could just put ourselves on to mute, that would be much appreciated throughout the session. Uh, and if we could take ourselves off camera as well, it just helps uh, limit the, the distractions for, for the guests and the presenters who are going through uh, the session and topics today. Um, so yeah, the round table is really a, a concept that was an, a kind of initiated over a coffee, um, you know, about 12 months ago now. Uh, and the round table is about bringing experts experts <laughs> and people from across industry. Uh, I didn't want to put myself in the bracket of an expert then, but um, yeah, the experts um, across industry to talk about specific subjects and topics um, that we uh, agree are useful and pertinent to the community that we have available to us. Um, and it's our own opinions. It's not the opinions of the companies that we work with. Um, and it's just about having a chat sharing our knowledge and our, our expertise and our information uh, and, and promoting dialogue and promoting some conversation on that uh, and hopefully we can take something away uh, from it and, and learn from it and implement some learnings or some ideas or some concepts in our own working environment. Um, when I was head of PMO at Babcock International Group many years ago um, sometimes it was a lonely place not knowing where to go to go and get some extra kind of knowledge or, or, or support uh, and I thought that's where the kind of the idea for a round table came from. So um, we do love feedback, we love improving, so if you do have any comments uh, please do uh, fire us an email at info at architectservices.co.uk. Um, we, we love to kind of get better at the things that we do um, and uh, yeah iterate on, on the services and, and the conversation of this, this round table. So it's great to see so many people attending, thank you very much for, for your contribution and I'll hand over to Giles to give us a, a, a brief intro. Thank you, Joel. Um, yeah, it, it does seem strange that we are on number five um, it, from when we talked about this. Yeah, probably about 12 months ago when we were sat having a coffee. So um, it's really it's been re a really interesting ride and we've had some really interesting feedback from people and we've had some really great comments. So I think throughout this this talk, I encourage people to engage and add their comments on what they're what they're thinking within the topics that we're talking about. Um, for myself, I'm a program director in the cabinet office. Um, I'm currently leading a program on cross government interoperability. So ensuring that sort of government works in the most efficient manner um, from a technology perspective is accessible to all, um, is optimized um, and makes best use of the funds that we have and provides sort of great public service outcomes. So that's kind of where I am. Um, I'm looking forward to this conversation on capacity plan because we've currently going through some capacity shortfalls at the moment so i've got some real time uh, comments to make on it so um so yeah looking forward to it great stuff thank you giles um so i am gonna push the boat out a little bit this time and do something that we haven't done before i always like doing something new but it might fail dramatically but we're going to use uh, the forms plugin today just to get a bit of feedback and engagement um so there will be a, a little kind of poll that will come up in in your chat window or the meeting chat in a few minutes time um encourage you to, to respond to that uh, as we go through um and yeah please do put questions and thoughts and, and opinions into the the meeting chat as we go throughout uh, the session it's just an open conversation a dialogue uh, as we said at the start there so yeah this month's uh, webinar we've got kerry taylor here so um kerry is um one of icotech's very very first customers which is absolutely amazing so uh, I think if it wasn't for Kerry and Giles we probably wouldn't be having this conversation really but <laughs> yes yeah, so uh, so welcome Kerry thank you for agreeing to do this and and this topic today is on why projects fail <laughs> is that is that irony there <laughs> we yeah. work together why be <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> so yeah why projects fail and more specifically on two subtopics the first being poor capacity planning and the second being undefined roles and responsibilities um, so what I'll do is I'll pass on to Kerry just to introduce herself and her background and her experience uh, and at the same time I'll just post a chat uh, a poll in the chat window uh, to say um, just to ask a quick question if uh, just to understand how many of us suffer from poor uh, capacity planning but um, Kerry do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah um, so I'm Kerry I work currently for Betty's and Taylor's and I'm responsible for our uh, strategic portfolio of change um, so we have a massive range of projects from R&D, new product development, HR projects, new machines in our factory, construction projects, shop refits for our cafes, um, IT, new application, list goes on and on. Um, and 
we tend in the past have managed those in silos and very separately with no overall sight of leadership team. So I'm here to kind of bring the oversight to the to the whole, and that is a definitely a work in progress and something um, that's have been evolving quite rapidly over the past couple of years. Um, but my background is project management. I've been delivering project, uh, sorry, technical projects and change both customer side and client side, uh, agency side, sorry, mainly in finance and insurance, um, but always been a bit of a stickler for how can we make this better? How can we learn? How can we improve? So I'm really excited about being part of this and kind of um, hearing more about other people's experiences in kind of these two areas. Um, so yeah. That's me. Cool. cool. Thanks, Kerry. Thank you very much. Um, yes. Yeah, so I think, you know, in two, in two parts, we, we've broken it down because why projects fail is such a broad subject, isn't it? We could be here for hours having a conversation. So we've tried to narrow down the suits, the two subtopics to poor capacity planning and undefined roles and responsibilities. Um, and yeah, I think it's just worthwhile just jumping straight into it. Uh, Kerry, do you want to go into subtopic one, poor capacity planning? You know, to take us through your findings, uh, your experience, your perspective, uh, and then uh, key points at the end. Be great. Yeah. Um, so I think capacity planning has always been key to my role for, for years, whether that's consuming it as a project manager or owning a process that enables us to have confidence in the delivery of a portfolio. Um, and when it's done well, it can be really powerful in setting up a project with a really strong foundation for delivery and a really good basis for decision making. And Giles, when we were talking prior to that, it's that hand in hand with prioritisation. Um, but it's often overlooked or undervalued or over engineered. I think those are kind of my experiences of um how it plays out in reality and it's a, a fine line between having the information available so that you can plan and make appropriate decisions and having quite a laborious process that consumes loads of time and effort and then isn't used for anything so people don't see the value of that time and effort um so it's that kind of that balance for me it's empowering and enabling team members to take responsibility for their own capacity so hang on i'm meant to be working on that but you're asking me to work on that because project managers are pushy they'll fit i know you're not meant to be but i know you're really good so can you just do this thing for me having people that feel that they can push that back or they can raise decision uh, raise escalations um and it requires project managers to uh, to plan properly and state clearly what's needed from who and when. Um, so it, it's so multifaceted that getting all those inputs is difficult. And I think that's why um, we see so many instances where the capacity planning is considered poor, but there's so many things you have to get right for it to be good capacity planning in my experience. I don't know, Giles, if you have the same. So experience. for the capacity planning for us, is it kind of where, actually, I've got a question for Joel from your experience, because when we worked together, um, we we were looking at the portfolio management, um, creating portfolio management tool. So this was all about prioritization, prioritization of work, looking at the resource we had, what we were assigning those that resource to prior to doing the work with Joel. We had been doing ad hoc planning, essentially, who was available, could work on it. There were localised uh, plans, localised project delivery plans. Um, there was lo localised resource management. So what we we're looking to do is create this portfolio management tool, which sort of future iterations of it would be a resource planning um, capability. Now, interestingly, we whilst I was there, we didn't get to the resource planning capability. My question to Joel is, in that sort of portfolio management and the resource planning capacity, the the use of tools and services to, as Kerry said, reduce the burden on those people who are doing resource management from your experience, how much does that play an important role in ensuring that you can get the correct resource assigned to projects at the right time? Mm. 
Yeah, great question. Thanks, Giles, for chucking me in there, the deep end on, on, on round one. But yeah, um, I think uh, tools are really important uh, part of it, but not not the right, not the whole sum of the answer. Um, some of the initial points that Kerry raised about there is empowering those people to make to take action is absolutely fundamental. And and if you, if we if um, you sit here and expect a tool to be able to do this for you or the tool to solve the problem, it's absolutely going to fail. You know, um, the tool is never going to sort of solve the problem in, in any aspect, is it especially uh, capacity planning but um I, I think for me it's about you know there's a couple of things that i kind of do in, in is is almost kind of i know i don't know how some people operate here but some people operate from what i call the day onwards you know taking today what's the plan going out to get this thing done um sometimes as somebody who likes to, to to achieve deadlines it's it's planning back and i read something from amazon uh jeff was kind of you know, a CEO of Amazon always kind of plan backwards. And it was one of the key, uh, key success factors was saying, what do we want to do by when? And actually, what do we need to do to get that done by then? You know, as opposed to actually planning from day current out, it, you know, that's, so that's kind of my, my, my take on it, but, um, and using tools to help you to do that. And um, Kerry, one of the, one of the things I, I was thinking about, as you were saying that is about um, owning the process, but confidence in that delivered the portfolio. But, how how detailed it is it is sufficient you know in your in your resource plans across your your team at the moment and across in your experience you know how how detailed is is sufficient to deliver that value um and you look like you're not, not going to take yourself off mute <laughs> <Love it. laughs> we've all um, done it we've all done it <laughs> thanks for telling me before i started speaking there it's okay um I think that's a really tough question and is so dependent on the people that you have involved in that process and how you're making decisions. Um, where I, I guess the only place I can answer it from is where I've seen it work well is not to a really deep level of detail, but it's more of on almost um, concept of we've got a thing, it's about these five things are so big and we can only do six big things. So therefore we don't have enough enough space for all of them. And that um, almost a their estimates, but taking into account that estimates are only guesses and let's not spend too much time on our on our guesses and going through. Um, I found that if you have a le higher level of information, but you're all working on the same concept of what that means. I'm, I'm struggling to articulate it, but um, it's the visualization of what that means to your your whole. It's knowing the the size of your pie and how much each of the, the slice of the piece of work take up of that pie. Um, for me, the bare minimum does the same job as a really detailed process. Yeah, Don't know if I've explained that well. It makes sense to me. And one of the other things that that I kind of look at and you talked about, um, you know, empowering those, enabling those teams to escalate. But it's this concept of in, in a delivery team in technology, if you're a business analyst or you're a developer or a tester, whichever kind of role you fulfill is that, you know, ha ha someone coming to you in a week and saying these are the things you're working on this week is you know, kind of can can kind of get people's backs up, really. And, mm -hmm. you know, I wonder how many people actually ask the technical team for their estimates as opposed to the head of development. And I know I've been I've been guilty of it myself. You know, I I go in there and carry we've had conversations where I'm kind of because because of the way the nature that I am, I'm spitballing ideas. I'm going all oh, that take a couple of days, carry if we do it that like a couple of days and then Chris gets it and we used to get it. Um, not now <laughs> because we took we changed that he used to he gets it and goes you know mate what, what is this this is this is you, you told me what i'm doing you told me what my priority is and you're telling me how long it's gonna take mm -hmm. you know i haven't had no contribution to this at all um yeah. so you know that that's one of the the points that i think i i, I wanted to raise um, in my view i don't know if you experienced that Kerry. and and absolutely so where i found it works best is where you're working um i don't want to say agile because i know that gets people <laughs> scared but where you're taking some of the really good parts of agile of we've got 10 days in our block here and we're right what is the estimate of this piece of work and the empowerment comes from well i've given you that estimate i've told you i can complete it by that point and now it's with me mm. to to do it in that time so i 
very much agree that empowerment, there's something about where you get your idea of how long something's going to take from and getting the people doing the job to contribute to that in whatever way it is. Yeah, absolutely. Charles, did you have a view on that? Yeah, so I was just going to take it up from from the same sort of principle, but from my perspective, it's going up and being able to say no or being able to explain why you don't have enough capacity. So we so within my role and then within the business union that I'm in, we take direction almost directly from sort of ministerial level. So there's always an everything's always a priority. Everything is really important. Everything needs to be done now. So it's it's being able to articulate to one work out where the priorities really lie. So um, I recently saw a document that had 30 priority areas to be delivered on. And wow, I sat down five. with those, they, I sat down and I was having a conversation and I said, well, it's unrealistic to be able to deliver against these 30 priorities in wh whichever team you work in, because they're so broad and there's such a, a large scope here. So I said, what were you, what realistically, if I had to, if I was sort of very blunt and said I can only fulfill five, what would the five you really want to do? And I think at the moment, the process that we're going through is prioritization of the work we have got to do over the next couple of months. It's not very long, but actually we're looking at, we've got seven priority areas that we need to deliver on. And what we've turned around and said, you know what, we don't currently have the capacity to fulfill these in this short space of time with this new piece of priority work that's come along, which is the spending review within government. So actually, we are trying to cut back on some of the work that we're doing to say, you know what, we can free up this capacity because we've got an overburden on reporting or there's a bunch of processes that we have to do. Could we reduce some of the process to or so cut away temporarily some of the process to free up some time for people to deliver against those priority areas? So I think you, you potentially we are overburdened with work for the for the number of, for the amount of resources we've got but a different way of addressing it is cutting back on the actual work rather than adding resource which i think people naturally go to the assumption that actually what we need to do is just throw resource at a problem and i think if anyone's read any of the scrum books or been on the scrum course you can see that there's an ideal size for a team you can see that actually throwing people at a problem doesn't necessarily solve the problem in fact actually could slow the process down mm -hmm. So I think it's it, there's multiple different layers of what you're how to approach that capacity planning rather than just saying, actually, we've got more work, so we need to bring in more people is actually saying, OK, we're going to focus on what really matters mm. rather than trying to do everything. And I think that's where my head is at, at the moment is trying to really cut through all of the noise of everything that's going on and being able to focus on the most important work, which is really tough because you've got to tell some stakeholder who's personal project is their most important priority is their vital for them for them to hit their targets is actually not an only overall in the grand scheme of things a priority or as high a priority as other stuff and go on okay and that for me is so key it's the reason we do capacity planning is to enable us to make decisions and to make decisions we need to present options so it's that we could do this or we could do that and understanding the impact of those options I think in my experience is where asking that question of there is we can't do everything yes we know everything is important and that's often where we fail and therefore we start off on projects that have got shaky foundations right from the start or we don't stop or slow or change a project at the right point until it's in crisis mode like no one wants to stop a project no yeah. one wants to pause a project no one wants yeah. to we, we talked about that before down. didn't we we talked about yeah. who doesn't want to stop a project but you know we talk here the theme is about you know capacity the planning the prediction the estimations of effort one of the things i don't see um and i, I see it lightly uh, at icotech we're trying to employ some of this uh, behavior is actually um actual actual data informs mm -hmm. future you know, if you can record what you're actually achieving now is in your performance of a task, then, you know, you should be able to inform the future. And I don't see many organizations that, that we work with um, 
other than ourselves because for obvious reasons we charge by every 15 minutes that we work on an activity right that's how we generate revenue so we have the timesheet so i know on average how long it takes us to deliver a risk table in the power platform mm -hmm. so i've got it mm -hmm. i've got it i've got it for, for for one customer for two customer for three you know i've got it there you know so and i think one of the things that and i think people overlook timesheets as this read this hindrance this pain that's my opinion and i just think that if we were able to capture even if it's not timesheets or even just durations at a higher level coming back to that level of detail what if we could capture how long things are taking then you know it's an average at least then you know you could say if you're gonna do a high level design um you know solution architect in three hours i could say to you well actually you know the system says that on average just takes us four weeks mate so how are you going to do it in three hours? How are you going to do it in, in three days or, or half a day? And I think that, you know, I think that that's one of my um, fixes, I guess. Um, is, agile is, delivery, Joel. Agile delivery. Trying to work out your I'm velocity. Sure, I'm, not, I'm not sure that's <laughs> agile. I'm just I'm just pretty sure that's just standard, you know, uh, data analytics, really, isn't it? Just understand how long it's taken you. Of course, it'll have it'll flow and you'll have variances against the norm. But um, for, for me, it, and it does work, you know, I know on average now how long these things take in, in our business because we've done them time and time again. But again, there's variances, velocities. You always need that human overlay. But I just wondered if if that was a, a a view you share, Kerry. I think you're gonna you're gonna counter my argument though. But but that's good. I like that. I'm torn. I'm torn because I've worked client side and agency side. So from an agency perspective, a your timesheets are valued and they are in more importance to people complete them more accurately. But you're also doing more repeatable stuff. So you've got that data is very useful. Looking at our portfolio at the moment, there's nothing that's the same. So having that data um, is really difficult to then, um, A, convince people to pre present it. And then when we've got it and we're comparing two things, it's not, not usable, but it's very difficult to, to translate and get something that is meaningful. Um, and I'd be really interested, the people on, on this call, to hear your experience of where it, have you found that work have you found a, a way that you can use timesheet data yeah that'd be really good if anybody's got an opinion just raise your hand on the teams and, and we'll come to you to, uh, to 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 share your view on that um you know i think that's a great question you know does timesheet data and actuals actually uh, help in, inform the future and, and even at, 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 at the performance of those tasks and um even if um you know it it doesn't it's just it's a concept really for, for me um and then giles your point was on focus and strategy and i think having a a a focus i mean i i think i, I joked but you probably didn't hear me but um it was the 35 priority areas um and um you, you know I, I said out of 35 you know because that's my experience it's like priority is do everything but but we come we come on to that separately Um, that's absolutely, I can, you know, understand that the, the the challenge there, and, and I do feel, in my experience, um, that when you ask somebody to timesheet, sometimes it's like this understanding, this, um, you know, are you watching me? Are you checking me? Are you mm -hmm. performance managing me? And it's like, you know, actually, um, it's, it, you've got to find that balance. You've got to find this is the reason why we're doing it, and this is actually we don't really care if it takes you ten hours and you five hours um, per se. And of course, being in my position running a small company, it's it's a lot easier to kind of to, to have that conversation with Matt or, you know, or Shantina or whatever. But yeah, in a large organization, when there's much more people. You've got to understand the people impact. But yeah, it's a really good point. Um, Kerry, did you have, have a, a point, a response to that? Uh, I completely agree. And um, uh, and picking up on your follow up, Joel, um, we at Betty's and Taylor's, we have a real issue with any kind of time management and are you are you um are you checking up on me it goes against a lot of the and um, the people values that we we hold but it is changing that from that um we're not monitoring what we're doing we're using it to enable less pressure in the future and to us to plan properly so we take off that pressure to you as individuals um, and that message doesn't land for what Ever reason it is, it's it's one of the issues that we do have and I've had in the past in a number of organisations. Yeah, yeah, and but 
even you know uh, appreciating um all those points are absolutely valid e- even just taking it up a level uh, away from timesheet in the hour uh, just you know understanding how long projects take to go through your stage gates you know on average it takes us you know giles we talk about discovery and the gds standard is four weeks have you ever done a discovery in four weeks i don't ever see it happen you know <laughs> so if somebody comes to me and says oh we're gonna do discovery in four weeks it's like no mate you're not <laughs> you know by the yeah. time you go because it's just a standard even at that very high level discovery alpha beta whatever, whatever it is you know just having that 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 um understanding the averages would, would, would help you know mm. at that very high level but appreciate think, there's uh, challenges for, all the way down for dolly for, the, for that question i mean I like the idea of the data and I like understanding how long it takes people to do a task and mainly from I think you need to couple it with sort of retrospectives and you need to couple it with what they why it's taking people that time so rather than just having it in a position where you you're monitoring time and then you're basing people's output on that time it's then taking that to the next level and saying okay why is it and don't get me wrong like we're all super busy and there's there's loads of uh, loads of pressures and HR and management of people isn't normally factored into managers and leaders time as in 50% of their time should be spent working with um, working with their staff to improve them. But I think if you're looking at that and you have a metric, you can then really focus on, OK, this person may be perfectly suited for this for this one task and do this task sort of lightning speed but actually this other area why is it taking them that much longer to deliver it they may not be confident enough to speak up about it they may not be happy with the the work that they're doing what it does is it signposts where there's sort of potentially some need for intervention and i don't mean intervention in a bad way of like detention or whatever like, it, maybe it's, like training or something like that. it's yeah exactly it's actually do they need some mentoring do they have they got something going on at home that's actually impacted their work life balance especially when we're all working from home actually there's potential issues there so why sort of the way i look at it is i like the idea of having metrics but it's got to be coupled with actually looking at that process and when you do it with the team and the other question i was going to ask is whether whether it's in a team or whether it's an individual so if they're working in the team it's a team output so you're saying like actually is there a bunch of blockers in place for me as a manager as me as a leader that i need to unblock that you then sit down you go through that retrospection and say well we couldn't get uh, we couldn't get a product manager we couldn't get a developer we couldn't get this person for three days so it took us three days longer actually if you free up that resource sooner or whatever then we can actually increase the speed of which we are going to deliver the x widget or whatever um so i think there's a couple of things there so is that actually understanding individuals and how they are performing from a time shooting perspective potentially i know it's not a great it's a bit of a blunt um blunt tool from people who hate it because they think your big brother watching them you're gonna mark them down for taking too long or whatever and we're not sitting in a car plant making parts like old school steel press or something like that so so yeah, so there's an opportunity there to look at what they're doing. So then you can improve their ability to deliver stuff, which then increases your capacity to deliver more. Yeah. Um, and think, then the other side, from a team perspective, improving team performance. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's just it just comes back around to my you know, to, to complete the full circle on it, uh, Giles. It just comes back around to that point you made about you know uh, uh, how do we know we need more capacity. Do you know what I mean? It's just when you've got that list of things, I think you, you know, you've got to be able to evidence. Uh, and however you do it, and obviously you were talking about tasks and and time and and, and outcomes there, and, and absolutely take on board everybody's points. You know, maybe it's just starting at, at a very high level is my suggestion. If you're not doing that now, you know, try and categorize things. You know, in terms of um, your, your HLDs or your, your maybe your, your plan's got 20 standard line items in it, and you're just kind of understanding like a HLD. Yeah, LLD or whatever it is, you know, the products you're creating, if you're doing those things, uh, carry through the life cycle, the, the same activities. I know you've got your life cycle is quite defined in terms of what you do or what stages, even though they are different projects, <laughs> um, you know, trying to capture how long uh, that that step takes in terms of time alone um would 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 allow you to kind of make some informed decisions about how many people you need and how much effort you need um and it obviously you can go uh top to bottom on that in, in detail um it's interesting the poll thank you everybody for i know i was just going to mention the poll i yeah. think it's fascinating yeah i really want to ask the one person that said no to yeah, come on and, and like yeah, saying, how do you do it <laughs> yeah yeah exactly what do you work for back and they can take the <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. But uh, there's a lot of people that you know. There's more that are said maybe um, than 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 yes. And if I'm honest, I thought everybody was just going to say yes. If I'm really honest, I thought we all had a problem with capacity planning. Um, but if you're perhaps one of those people that said maybe, um, and maybe perhaps maybe, and, and perhaps the person that said no, uh, if you would like to put, raise your hand and we'll come to you and ask for your perspective, it'd be great to know, um, you know, some of the things that you've implemented uh, to, to 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 you know create that um, I guess um, that 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 environment uh, where you don't have a problem or maybe not have a problem with capacity planning. Um, but um, what I'll do is I'll just summarise some points then, and this is you know you can see this is a test to see if I've been listening. Um, you know, and take us a note in the background. Um, and then we'll move on to subtopic two um, and go from there. But effectively, um, some of Kerry's key points are about empowering and enable teams to make their own uh, decisions, and their own actions and, and, and raise their points. Um, and it's, I, I guess it's not too much of a, uh, Kerry's point was not uh, too much of a deep level of detail. Sometimes having, you know, just a, a spot check and whether, you know, it's detail that's needed or if it's a high level building block planning approach um, can, can help. Um, my view was all was about planning backwards from what you want to achieve. So don't plan from the day forward, plan backwards. What do we need to do by when in order to get that done? Uh, uh, and who needs to do it? Thus, how many people do, do we need? Um, and I've just got a, a be uh, like a chip on my shoulder about data. I just love actuals. <laughs> I just don't know what actuals inform the future. Um, and that's important. And then uh, Giles' point was around strategy and focus, not having too many things to do, um, and you know having a, a little bit of a view on on the skills gap versus task management, um, which is which is really good. So um, yeah, not having too much to do um, was Giles's kind of um, not too much to focus on was, was Giles's uh, point there. Um, I'm just conscious of time at this, uh, here, so subtopic two is undefined roles and responsibilities. Um, Kerry, do you want to take us through this this subtopic? Yeah, I, I mean, this one feels like it's the uh, in the core of good project management that everyone should have a project with set roles and responsibilities. But for me, this is going outside of your standard project roles and looking at as a business, what are your roles and responsibilities? What is the thing that says I care because um, and we particularly we're feeling this a lot at the moment at, at Betty's and Taylor's. Um, and I think part of the root of it is because of COVID, especially in the IT department and some of our bigger programmes, everyone started to play out of position to cover for people that were poorly, that were unavailable due to homeschooling. There was a, a big shift in what the focus is. So everyone was very much right. Roll your sleeves up. Whatever needs to happen, I'm there, which is great. But what's left happen is nobody quite knows who's responsible for what um, and the knock is effect that when a project land when a project goes into that environment where everyone's a bit like well who cares about the support afterwards and who cares about who's delivering this change we don't have a highly functioning team in the project so we end up having lots of people into meetings because, well, well, actually, I might have a little bit to say on that. Um, we're a bit unclear who's the decision makers and four or five different people feel like they should be the decision maker. Um, we're not. The lack of clarity means we tend to go around the loop of decisions quite a few times, which either delays things or needs rework. Um, and we've got this situation at the moment where it feels, and this is almost linking back to capacity planning and not being very efficient, we've got quite a lot of overlaps of people covering the same area, but then also we've got gaps. So in delivering our projects, we're not being very effective, efficient, um, and those gaps are the ones that are blindsiding us. Um, so for me, this is a one, it's almost like, I know we need to define this, but it's biting us and getting to the point where we need we're we're redefining it is feeling like a lower priority mm. to to everything but i'm not sure it should be yeah absolutely who's doing what is mm -hmm. um you know really important isn't it and who does what in the project life cycle is absolutely paramount to the successful delivery of a project and one of the core mm -hmm. reasons why projects fail in my experience and um one of my key points for this is getting the right people doing the right jobs 
You know, it really is about uh, Dolly point, Dolly's point earlier about capability, different levels of skills, you know, is, is transferable to this topic where, you know, if you've got the right people who are skilled and capable doing the right jobs, um, then, you know, that you've got a, 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 an increased chance of uh, delivering successfully. Um, and I think it does link, uh, you know, to poor capacity planning. If you don't know how many solution architects you need, how many BAs you need, um, then you, you will have gaps in that in that space. But um, one of the questions I had, um, just thought provoking, is have you ever, have, any, have either of you ever updated a job spec like six to 12 months after somebody's joined? You're nodding. Charles is on mute. <laughs> Second one. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so yeah, job specs are really an interesting one. I'm just going to go, go to a comment just about the, the the responsibilities, which comes in with the role. So when you join and I look at job specs and I look at what you're often told, look at a job and yeah, can you do most of it? When you actually get into a role, you realise that it's very different to what that JD actually says. Okay. And I, I find this all the time when I look at a JD and you think maybe you're one up when you're looking for a new job and you're looking actually and you go, crikey, they want the world. But when you actually speak to the person who's recruiting, so the recruiting agent or the recruiting manager or whatever it is, you realize that they want a completely different set of skills, really. They want you to focus on a completely different or a bunch of other things outside of that role. So I think there is something between what your standard role or for a head of PMO, delivery manager, whatever, there's, there's a set of requirements that you're expected to achieve, but every single role that you go into has a different set of responsibilities. So for the example I was going to use, I was recently approached by a new person to government who had taken on a head of PMO role, and they were talking to me about actually what areas they should be focusing on. So we were looking at, they had an excellent sort of customer journey. They had it all set out of how they were going to get projects from the department into the system, how they were going to progress them through the agile delivery process and then into live and then decommission them. So they had this all set up about what this process was. However, at each stage of that process, the responsibilities weren't clearly defined. So mm -hmm. what we were finding and what I said there, the, the biggest benefit they could provide was to clearly define at each stage what the responsibilities and where those touch points were. So where were people responsible with providing information? So, for example, when a new project started, when they were engaged, when a new project was brought to the board, they were ensuring that someone had the responsibility to speak to the technology team who would then ask the questions, right, actually, how are we, how does this fit in with our current architecture and our strategy? How are we going to support this service when it's brought into live? Rather than getting all the way through develop a tool and a service and a project, a product, get to the point where the technology team are broadsided by it. And it's like, well, we've spent all this money on it, but so now you've got to support it, but then they're not resourced for the correct, um, the correct level. So that goes to capacity planning. They then end up burdened with something that they haven't had input in and how it's designed. So I think the responsibilities piece is vital, but that was very much sort of different to the key roles in job description that Joel was talking about. So for me, responsibilities, defining what people's responsibilities are, especially in a process like being a PMO manager and a, a delivery process, avoids this misunderstanding of someone else is doing it or missing information. Yeah. Uh, and we we get that you know a, a lot, isn't it, in terms of the the translation of who's doing what, and a, and a race will help you do that in, in its most simplest form, won't it? Um, yeah, and, and it's and very define... simple stuff. It yeah. doesn't need to be super fancy. It's just very simple stuff, which enables people to clearly know what they are responsible for, rather than lots of people thinking, oh well, well that's the tech team's um, role, and that's the business analyst role, and that's the business partner's role. Yeah, I, I do think though, you know, kind of you know, back to my question earlier is that, you know, I've had a number of roles in, in corporate world where, you know, the job spec was, was the advertised job spec. I applied for it and, you know, I don't think we looked at it again. We might have done some level of objectives at some point throughout the journey, but, you know, it was like this thing that just got parked and that's just my experience. And I just, 
And I think that if you can, if you can, you know, continually evaluate and evolve a job description, it's not just this thing seen at the start of the journey to attract you into a role. Mm -hmm. Then I think we can get because our roles will change as we learn more, as we take on more. We've got more ideas that come out of our workshops to go and do these things. We build up more things to go and do, more features to, to build, more problems to go and solve, more processes to build. Do we actually go back to the the to the job spec, the the role I'm performing, and say, actually now, you know, the the, the, the you know this this function is now within your role um, as it, as it stands today. And secondly, do do you know objective setting, ob objective tracking? Um, again, I've seen some customers uh, of ours do it very quick, very kind of iteratively, right, very kind of frequently. And then other customers that kind of do it at the start of the year, then leave it. And I and I kind of say to them, well, surely lots has changed in that year because you're doing lots of workshops and lots of designs and thinking, um, and you've you've got new requirements for your systems. But whose responsibility is it to go and own that piece of functionality, like benefits tracking or whatever it might be? You know. Um, but yeah, that's my view. Kerry, do, do, is, you kind of nodded and said, yes, you, you've gone back through job specs and reviewed them. Um, yeah, we we do. I think the responsibility for making sure your job spec is up to date is with the individual as well to kind of say, am I still doing, the, from, again, going back to that accountability um, is empowering people to say, my job description doesn't really match up to what, what I'm doing and want to update it. We've just um, implemented what they're calling line of sight so job specs through to strategic approaches through to setting objectives so that there is yes the job spec might not go to that granular level of detail you see in a process but you can see how things track through and um, that's very much in i'd say concept rather than actually working in uh work, working in reality but something you mentioned you guys mentioned there about um writing roles and prescriptions for a project or a process and doing a racing matrix i'm going to say something potentially a little bit um, <laughs> um i think those documents and they're, they're read by change professionals people that are used to being in projects and they yeah i understand as a project manager this is what i'm responsible pmo manager yeah i'm, I'm i've read that in my experience, people that are all, that are key to a project, but maybe on the edge of that change professional journey, I don't think that they are finding the information we produce as projects of this is what you're responsible for, easy enough to digest. And when we ask them it, it, the, it at the beginning of a project, quite often they go, oh yeah, 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 I can, I can do that. And then when they get into the reality of that means you have to attend these meetings and you have to be responsible and you have to be available and you have to approve these documents. That's when they kind of go, oh, no, this is a bit much. And I'm wondering if anyone else has shared that experience of um, of finding it hard to translate roles and responsibilities to maybe business functions. And if there's any hints or tips of how to maybe land that a little bit better. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And if somebody's done that well in their organisation, then yeah, please feel to come, feel free to come off um, mute or just raise your hands, and we'll, we'll come to you. Um, because you know, it, it, in my experience as you know, head of PMO, you know, in Babcock, I guess it was a much larger organisation, so there's a lot more people in the cog of the project delivery lifecycle, um, and. You, you know, kind of you had people to go to to do these uh, certain um, activities. And yeah, I can see how a, a racy doesn't help the end user to understand exactly what they do when it just says create this thing or do this thing, you know, and I'm accountable or and I'm informed or whatever, whatever it is. I mean, geez, I think we could do another another one, uh, Giles, on what does accountable or informed or responsible actually mean? Because <laughs> yeah. there's different opinions or what is even racy? Yeah. I've heard lots of different analogies. It's like the raid log, the what, <laughs> uh, you know? Um, so yeah, I think the, um, yeah, ha having, making sure you articulate to those people what you're expecting of, of them in that process and what that role requires you to do in that process is 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 a challenge. It's very difficult to do. Um, and also you, you kind of want to mix giving people clear roles responsibilities with the freedom to go and you know be creative express themselves prob problem solve um so there is a balance there isn't there um uh, so it it is it the project failure and that miss either misunderstanding 
And that's what I think we're trying to get to essentially with the roles and responsibilities is defining what people are, what they need to do to make a project a success. And then if you can define all the components of that project mm -hmm. and define who is responsible for delivering that, mm -hmm. you can then realistically, the project should be a success because mm -hmm. you should have everything squared away. And now we know that's not the case because there are going to be people away, people sick, people leave, people change, projects develop and change, change direction. But Harry, do you think it's down to people misunderstanding what their role is and potentially that's down to job description or, or management or do you think it's down to capability? So I think, as Joel mentioned, when you look at job descriptions, you go into an interview and I think interview processes, actually, there's another one I could potentially talk about. Interview processes are fundamentally flawed in the fact that you can, you can they rely on someone being very confident in the ability, their ability to present and to be able to talk to people. Whereas you could have a very technical person who actually hates, it's quite introverted, that hates talking to people, um, who is actually not able to get come across very well. And then they may not get the role, but they may be the right person for it. Do you, do you think it's a personal capability issue or do you think it's definition is it not enough clarity in the definition of what people should what need to what they need to produce from a responsibilities perspective i think it's a bit of both maybe um lack of clarity lack of capability but i don't know if there's something you know when you define a scope for a project and mm. defining what's out of scope is almost just as important as telling me what I am responsible mm. for. So don't, don't yeah. you use that? Don't you use that statement that says anything not in scope is out of scope? Oh, I but hate uh, that. That's my absolute <laughs> pet hate. That's like all else back better off. But, but quite often the in scope, oh yeah, I knew that, I knew that. But the out of scope are the ones you go, oh hold up. So if you're not doing that, who is? Mm. Um and I it's the gaps for me between people kind of going, well, I know that's not me, yeah. but then who who is it? And that's maybe where um, I'm finding at the moment our project managers are getting confused is because there's no one person, there's multiple people that are all trying to fill that gap, but not doing it very well. Yeah. Um, and, and it's a diff difficult thing to, to balance, isn't it? And, and the level of detail is is different. Uh, and if you've got a, a varying portfolio like you have, Kerry, where you've got you know estates, you know product development through to technology, um, if you've got one portfolio type like you know uh, let's call it like a, a theme in a portfolio, for example, which might be technology. Um, one of the things I have seen work well is actually the documentation of, of a PMO process was was quite, <clears throat> in my experience, it can be quite PMO heavy. Like the project does this, the project does that. But if you can go down to the next level of detail on that and actually say, look, the the, the solution architect does these things, and mm -hmm. you know just identifies mm -hmm. against this product in in the stage, you know that 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 is actually like the, the, the it gets to quite a heavy document in the end, but it's actually quite referenceable. Um, and and obviously people interpret language differently, right? You know, we all know that. But if it, at least if you can have um, you know that documented, what happens in that? product that design who does that solution architect does that and these are their roles within that that activity and as a standard and then you know um the, you know, the ba does this for example and then the head of projects does that and the head of it does that and the head of security does that you know i guess it's it's that level of detail i have seen uh work is quite well and a lot of the customers we work with i say give us your pmo process and it is literally the project it's always in that user profile of the project manager who kind of who knows how to use the system and the tool as opposed to the actual collection of the individuals um, around them. Uh, it's just something I've seen that worked well before to, to try and solve some of the, those problems. Um, but yeah, if, if anybody's got a point they wanted to raise through the meeting chat, please do um, You know, put, put a perspective in there. We'd love to, to read it. If anybody's got any views uh, that'd like to raise their hand and we'll come to you just to express your thoughts on how you may have done this well in, in your organization. Um, uh, yeah, so I guess objectives then. Um, do, do you, so you guys, you both do objectives. I guess you bigger organisations. You, do you love a good well. objective, don't you, Joel? You love your you love your forecast and you're looking out <laughs> in front and goals and objectives. Yeah, it's 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 vital. Like for projects to fail and looking at those roles and responsibilities, and as Kerry is saying, that process that you're trialing, that line of sight to go through strategy to 
And I think the, the roles and responsibilities are directly linked to your objectives and your mm -hmm. yearly goal setting. Absolutely. It really, really makes sense. And if, if you're not managing your people well, they lose sight of what they're trying to achieve. And so what is their role? What are their responsibilities, which should be linked to them, their objectives for the year, which then allows them to perform against those responsibilities they have. So I, can't, I, can't, I have to admit, I'm not very good at it. Like I set my own in sort of my personal life. I've sort of, I try and do like a four quadrants and pick four areas of my life that I'm going to focus on um, work, family, son, whatever, personal development, whatever it is for you. Round, round table. Round tables. Uh, it's actually all round table. Um, <laughs> but um, when you folk, like try and pick some areas and then look for those, what are you trying to achieve? Three things in each, each one. So I do that. I don't particularly use the civil service one. Uh, which I probably should do more. I focus a lot more on, on I, to my own um, uh, failings. I focus a lot more on my staff and making sure that theirs are in place and I kind of neglect my own um, to create that profile so I can then evidence against it. So at the end of the year, when I'm talking to my line manager or whoever is assessing, I can say, oh, I did this, 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 and this. I'm sure it's good for my team, but I probably should do it for, my, for myself. So I know potentially I'm not a very good role model for it, but I think they're really important. And in terms of uh, undefined roles and responsibilities, if I just summarize the key points then, and again, this is a test of my uh, writing and talking skills. Um, but I, I think, uh, Kerry, you mentioned that there's a lot of people that are out of position at the moment that are playing multiple hats or multiple roles, potentially because of COVID. It does feel like we've all, I don't know, does it feel like we've all got busier or rolled our sleeves up, as you said, you know, just getting in, helping out, you know, realizing how, you know, important things are in, in our little little part like we're getting involved. But does that create um, unclear roles and responsibilities? I think is, is kind of the, the points really. And, you know, there's a there's a potential that nobody knows who is responsible for what. Um, it definitely going round the loop on decisions is something that I see a lot of times, especially in our business as well. You know, didn't we decide that three months ago? Didn't we discuss that three months ago? Why aren't we? Why have we not kind of moved on and done something from that? Why are we going backwards into that space? Um, and that results in you know delivering projects having lots of gaps and lots of you know lots of gaps and lots of overlaps as well. Um, and then my points was um, really around, you know, job specs getting updated. I think it's something that I've recognised in, in my experience that, you know, do we update the role based on new ideas and new responsibilities as we go throughout our journey in our in our organisations? And I think that's really key to go back. If we're not doing that, if anybody's not doing that, then I encourage you to kind of go back and have a look at that. And you know, uh, setting clear objectives is, is is really important as well. And you know, even just trying to keep it simple. Um, yeah, it is 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 really value add. And I like Kerry's point as well around that line of sight. You know, we do it in development where we've got kind of deliverables, objectives, deliverables, you know, I guess right way now around now, but requirements, features, you know, the whole thing. It's like it, it, everything is linked together, test cases in EV model. Well, actually, if you can see what your what contribution you're adding, um, I think there was like a comment somewhere that said, um, I don't know, it was an American diplomat went to a space agency and said, you know, so what's your role here uh, in, uh, and to the cleaner? And the cleaner went, I'm helping put a man on the moon, you know? And mm -hmm. it was like, he, he felt like he was part of that wider pe picture, even though he was just the, the cleaner, you know, because he could see his contribution to, to, to the wider course. I think that's really important to, uh, to, to show that. Thank you, uh, firstly, Kerry, thank you very much for, for joining this session. Um, much appreciated. Thank you, Giles, for for co-hosting it with me. Woo! On to the on to the Go sixth team. one. Uh, yeah, can't, can't can't wait for the next one. Um, we are amazingly on Spotify. Don't know why, <laughs> but if you wanted to to listen to this back on Spotify, it will be up on Spotify in a couple of weeks' time. Um, you can follow Icotech on the social channels. Um, I really do hope you found it useful. Um, thank you, Ian, Dolly, and Paul for your contributions uh, to the conversations today and to everybody that responded to that poll as well. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for your time today. Um, and we look forward to, to hearing to seeing you on the next one. Um, 
and uh, again if you've got any kind of questions any improvement points you know please do we do love to get a bit of constructive criticism so we can improve uh, each time we do these things we're just doing it for a bit of fun uh, and to share our um, experiences with with you all um, and ultimately get better at the things that we love to do so uh, yeah info at icotechservices.co.uk if you have any other uh, feedback for us uh, at a later date but other than that um, thank you very much uh, stay healthy stay safe and um, we'll catch you on the next one